Hi, welcome back. If you're in any part of finance, whether it's valuation, corporate finance, portfolio management, the reality is country risk is something you have to get comfortable with. There was a point in time, not that long ago, when you could live in your domestic market and not care about the rest of the world, especially if you're a US analyst, investor, or corporation. Those days are behind us, and here's why. Every investor, every company, every portfolio manager has been told that the way to diversify is to go global. And in a sense, we've taken up that advice, right? And as we go global, the reality is it's very difficult to find companies that are exposed only to domestic risk. Not impossible, but very difficult. So when you look at a Coca-Cola or you look at, um, at a Microsoft, you might think you're valuing U.S. companies, but the reality is these are global companies that happened through the accident of history to be U.S. incorporated. The same way, if you value an Infosys, an Indian company, a Vale, a Brazilian company, let's face it, these are Indian and Brazilian companies only in name. The reality is they too are multinationals that get their revenues from much of the world. The bottom line is that as an investor analyst or company, you have to start to be able to understand the trade-off <clears throat> from, from looking outside your market. What's the trade-off? Especially in developed markets for a long time, investors gave credit to companies that went into emerging markets. Why? There's more growth there. That's true, but with that growth comes risk. And if you're unwilling to assess the risk that is created from these decisions, you're going to overexpand. So in this session, I'd like to talk about country risk. Before I do that, though, let me talk about why until about 30 years ago, country risk didn't even make it into textbooks or into valuation. For a long time, the advice was, if you ignore it, it'll go away. Sounds like strange advice, right? But it's an extension of the diversification argument. And here's how it went. If you're a company invested in 60 or 65 different countries, the argument was that country risk is diversifiable, that what happens in one country will be offset by another. And you know what? In the 1980s, that was probably pretty good advice. A Coca-Cola in the mid-80s could use a 12% dollar cost of capital around the world and ignore the fact that some of its business might be in Russia, some of it might be in Brazil, some of it in India, and hope that everything averaged up. That argument, though, rests on the premise that risk in countries is idiosyncratic, that there's very little correlation across countries. Again, in the mid-1980s, that was generally true. What happened in Sao Paulo did not really affect what happened in Mumbai. What happened in Mumbai had no effect on what happened in Moscow. That, again, is history. Today, if Sao Paulo has a bad day, Mumbai feels the pain. We're all connected at the head. And that effectively means that even if you're in multiple countries, 60, 65, 70, you're not going to be able to diversify away country risk. The way this is going to show out is when you have a global shock, and not, no matter what market, you're going to see it percolate all the way through the world. And emerging markets are going to see or f and feel the pain a lot more than developed markets, even if the crisis started in a developed market. So let's start talking about country risk. If you think about country risk, the most obvious country risk that comes to mind to most, most people when they think about it is exchange rate risk. When a company or an investor invests outside its domestic market, the reality is you're exposed to exchange rate risk. It is going to affect your revenues and your earnings and your cash flows if you're a company and your returns if you're an investor. But that is really not the key risk if you ask me because Exchange rate risk is a manifestation, a manifestation of much more real fundamental risk. The risks you worry about are political and economic risks, and those risks might manifest themselves in exchange rates, but they, they might, they're far deeper. So the question then is, what are these source of country risk? How do we bring them into the decision process? And to deal with that, I'm going to start at the source. Let's think about the reasons why some countries are riskier than others. The first is a life cycle argument. I've used the argument of life cycle to explain why companies at different stages in the life cycle have both different growth potentials and different risks. Young companies have all of their value come from the future, and not surprisingly, they also have a lot more risk. Mature companies have a lot less growth potential, but they have less risk. I am going to extend that argument of a life cycle into countries. Countries that are early in the life cycle, young growth economies, have a lot of potential, but they also have a lot of risk. As countries mature, you should see the, both the growth and the risk decline. So as you look across the world and you put countries in different stages in the life cycle, you should expect to see a correlation with country risk. 
younger countries should have more exposure to country risk than more mature countries. Not always, but most of the time. Second, let's talk about political risk. It is a reality that in many markets, politics and governments add to the risk in that market. How? By changing regulation, by affecting laws, by, by the process of running the business. There are many ways in which political risk affect, affect, affect countries, not only through the economies, but there are measurable dimensions on which you can capture political risk. In fact, let me talk about two. One is, while this is not always the case, in general, countries with a lot of political risk, a lot of political instability, also tend to be countries with a lot of corruption risk. Second, in general again, while again not always true, countries with a lot of political risk also tend to have more exposure to violence. So let's talk about how the world looks in terms of both corruption risk and violence. This is from, a, from an entity called Transparency International that measures corruption across countries. So don't, don't jump down my throat if you don't like the way your country measures on this corruption index. But they capture a corruption index. And in this corruption index, you can see the world as it's described, the green parts are the less corrupt parts of the world. And as you move towards the redder parts of the world, you're going to the more corrupt parts of the world. I've listed the least corrupt and the most corrupt countries according to Transparency International. And generally, there are no surprises. If you operate in Northern Europe, you're operating in pretty non-corrupt parts of the world. If you operate in big chunks of Africa and Asia you, and Latin America, you have to deal with corruption at, at some level. You're saying, who cares? If you're, running an, if you're a business operating in a country, having to deal with corruption is like having to pay an extra tax. In fact, I've argued that corruption and bribery are the equivalent of an informal tax that you pay on top of a formal tax. In countries with a lot of corruption, your 25% tax rate and operating income very quickly could become 45 or 50%. Second, let's talk about exposure to violence. From what? From war, from terrorism, from internal crime. So this again is, a, is, is, is from a service that measures violence across countries. It's, a, it's an entity called um, Vision for Humanity. It measures, uh, measures violence risk. And again, it, is, it, you know, it makes its own judgment on how to measure violence. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's one proxy, one measure of violence. And again, you can see the world based upon exposure to violence. The greenest parts of the world are the least violent. And it's a kind of a surprise that, you know, you might be surprised that the US and Mexico are more violent than much of Latin America. But that, in fact, might be the case, according at least to this index. Africa, obviously, is, is pretty risky, lots of exposure risk. But the safest country in the world, according to this particular entity, at least, is Botswana, which surprised me. But I don't know much about Botswana. I, I know it's one of the safest countries in Africa. And I want to let my regional biases drive me into saying that can't be right. But you can see that the exposure violence, again, is, again, something you want to think about in business. Because if you operate a business in a country with a lot of violence, it adds to your costs. It makes it more difficult for you to make decisions. It makes it more difficult for you to keep employees. All of those things make it difficult, more, uh, 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 in terms of risk, increase your exposure to risk and perhaps make the country a less attractive country to invest in. The third dimension on which I want to talk about risk is legal risk. What's legal risk? If you operate a business, you need somebody to protect your rights as a business. The rights to your property, the rights to your assets, the rights to intellectual property. And again, this, this right varies across the world, both in terms of how, how well the laws are written and how well they're enforced. You could have the best written laws protecting property, but if it's not enforced in a timely way, might as well have no laws at all. So this breaks down how, country, uh, how different parts of the world measure based on, property, uh, on overall property rights. And they, it's again, no surprises. North America measures high, so does the European Union. But there are parts of the world where you can see Africa, for instance, where property rights are not highly respected. And that, again, makes it more difficult, both as a business as an investor operate, adds to your risk. Final measure of risk is to the degree that a country is very dependent on one or two commodities for the bulk of its uh, of its success as an economy, you're more exposed to risk. Now, this is not always a choice. If you're a small Latin American country, you might be, whether you like it or not, very exposed to copper prices. Nothing you can do about it, but it does increase your exposure to risk.
This is from a UN um, uh, organization study of how much economies are dependent on one or two commodities. And again, you can see wide variation across the world with Latin America and Asia revealing, a, especially Africa, you know, revealing a very heavy dependence on one or two commodities for the bulk of their for the bulk of the GDP, making them more exposed to risk. So in summary, there are lots of fundamental reasons why risk varies across countries. And in, in a different way, what I'm saying is if you're an investor, the kind of returns you should demand the country should depend should deter, be determined by these fundamentals. So let's talk about measuring country risk. There are broad measures of country risk which are, which try to bring in all these different fundamentals. They're country risk scores. The problem with these country risk scores is they're not standardized. The World Bank has one, political risk services is a second one, the Economist is a third one. None of them are comparable to each other. They don't even follow the same scale. For instance, one in some services, low numbers reveal low country risk. In another service, high numbers might reveal low country risk low country risk and they're not scalar which basically means that if you get a country risk for twice that of another country you're not necessarily twice as risky you might be eight times as risky so country risk scores exist and i'll point and i'll give you at least one snapshot of one country risk score but generally it's very difficult to convert them into investment decisions either as an investor or a business there are financial market measures of country risk. You're saying this is good, they're going to be easier to incorporate. That's true, but they tend to be narrow. They tend to be focused on default risk. In particular, there are sovereign ratings. You might not think much of ratings agencies, but the reality is, at least if nothing else, they provide country risk scores that are easily accessible, cheap, and available for a lot of countries. You also have a market-based measure of default risk called the sovereign CDS and that's been around for about 15 years and that is a more updated measure with all of the limitations of market risk measures. So let's start with country risk scores. PRS, Political Risk Services, a Europe-based uh, risk measuring entity, measures risk across countries and assigns a score with a low score going with a high country risk and a high score going with a low country risk. Here again is what the world looks like. You notice that the green areas are the safest parts of the world, at least according to political risk services. No surprise here. You have North America, much of Europe. But here's a surprise. Europe is starting to look better than it did 10 or 20 years ago. Latin America and Africa are more exposed to risk. You'll also notice a lot of blank spaces. That's because political risk services doesn't cover all countries. So to the degree that a country doesn't have a score, it's going to show up as a blank. Here's the second, you can have sovereign ratings. Here you see more of the world covered, but here you're looking at a ratings agency. I've used Moody's ratings here, and again, green means you have a high rating, a AAA rating. Ratings, remember, have, are alphabetic, and they go all the way down to D, and you can see Africa and Latin America again pop up as the classic culprits of country risk, more country risk there. And finally, you have sovereign CDS preps. And here again, you see a lot of blank spots, and here's why. There are only about 79 countries for which there are sovereign CDS spreads. Less than half the world has it. And again, green indicates low country risk according to sovereign CDS spreads. The, um, the reds and the blacks indicate more risky countries. But Asia is starting to look a lot more stable than it used to, indicating at least a maturing of Asia as a continent in terms of risk. Finally, let's talk about equity risk. The default spread approaches are great, but when I'm an equity investor, I want a more composite, a broader measure of risk. So at the start of every year and the middle of every year, like right now, I update my equity risk premiums by country. And here's how I do it. I start by estimating an implied equity risk premium for the S&P 500. For those of you who follow me on my blog and read my website, I do this at the start of every month. And the start of um, July of 2019, the number I got was for the US was 5.67%. I'm gonna make that my base premium for a mature market. What's a mature market? I'm gonna cheat. If you have a AAA rating as a country, I'm gonna give you that 5.67%. If you're not AAA rated, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take your rating and estimate a default spread that goes with that rating by looking at both sovereign CDS spreads and dollar denominated bonds. Basically, if you tell me, a, for instance, uh, your, that your rating is BAA2, I'd say that your default spread is 2.09%. And then I'm going to scale up that default spread for the fact that equities are riskier than bonds. And the way I do this is by cheating. I look across all emerging markets and collect the standard deviation in equities across all emerging markets. 
And then I divide that standard deviation by the standard deviation in emerging market government bonds. That ratio is what I compute as the additional risk of equity. At the start of 2000, July 2019, that was 1.22. So here's how it would work out. Let's say you have a country with a BAA2 rating, and let's say the default spread is 2% for a BAA2 rating. 2 times 1.22 gives me 2.44% as my additional risk premium for the country. I'm going to add that on to the 5.67%, and I'm going to get 8.11%. That is going to become my equity risk premium for your country. And I repeat this for every country. So what you're going to see on the next page is actually my world as it looks in terms of equity risk premiums. Again, green indicates lower equity risk premiums. So you're going to see, of course, North America, Europe. And again, Asia is starting to look greener. And Africa and Latin America, no surprises, remain hotbeds of country risk in terms of having higher equity risk premiums. Incidentally, I have the entire list of equity risk premiums by country on my website. So you go to my website, click on updated data. You should be able to get the July 2019. I will also add it as an attachment to this YouTube video so you can download the entire and, and you can look up for your country what the risk premiums look like. Now, one final point. These are ways of estimating equity risk premiums for countries. But remember, your job when you're an investor is to often assess equity risk premiums for companies. You think, what's the difference? Companies are not exposed to risk based on whether they're incorporated. They're exposed to risk on based on whether they do business. So if you're in six countries and you're a Latin American company based in Brazil, your equity risk premium as a company is going to be a weighted average of those six countries you're in. Weighted by what? I tend to use revenues, but I'm not stuck on that. If you have production or operations or, or, or EBITDA by region, use those weights. I'm effectively looking for a weighted average. So imagine estimating an equity risk premium for a Coca-Cola. It's going to be a weighted average of the regions of the world you operate in. And in the same way, if you're a multinational estimating a hurdle rate for a project, well, you can't have a corporate hurdle rate. That makes no sense. You need to know what business the project is in, what country the project is in. G in its good old days, when it actually took investments, would have had a very, or should have had a very different hurdle rate for an aircraft engines project in the U.S. as opposed to an appliance project in India. It doesn't make any sense to me that you have hurdle rates that don't vary across, com across countries or businesses. So what's the bottom line? We've reached an air a time in, in, in global markets where there are lots of gray lines. The line between developed and emerging markets has which used to be a stark one, where on one side stood uh, you know, stood central banks that were independent, governments that did not interfere, and economies that were stable. On the other side, you had unstable governments with central banks with interference and economies that were all over the place. Well, that might have been the pre-2008 world, but in the world that we live in, there are lots of gray sh shades of gray. And um, it, there is a convergence, at least on some dimensions of risk. That said, though, those people who think that that convergence is complete and use one equity risk premium around the globe, I think are asking for trouble. I think both companies and investors have to accept the reality that though we have converged as a world, there are still wide differences across countries and that the type of investment return I would need. I mean, and I'm holding currency short, uh, I'm, I'm holding currency fixed. It, the kind of return I would need to make for a Nigerian investment still has to be much higher than the kind of return I would need to make for a Swedish investment. And that seems like common sense, but it's amazing how much pushback you get on that basic phenomenon. So I hope you've enjoyed this session.